Muy buenas tardes. En nombre del Banco Interamericano. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, we want to welcome you to the event Cybersecurity in the COVID-19 era. This will be a dialogue between the IDB's president, Luis Alberto Moreno, Eagle Uno, Paz Esteban, and Nuria Simo, manager of the information division of the IDB. The event would be conducted in English with simultaneous interpretation available into Spanish. For those who are listening, you can go down to the globe icon on the bottom of your screen and select the language that you prefer. Go ahead, President Moreno. Good afternoon to everyone, and I would like to very specially yield the floor to Paz Esteban, Mr. Igal Uno, and our other colleagues who are joining us for today's webinar, Nuria Simo. Cybersecurity is one of the subject areas that is of greatest concern for citizens as well as for political leaders all over the world and of course uh, all over the region. There's no doubt that this quarantine and the enormous amount of remote work that's being conducted on a day-to-day -day basis is making our dependence on technology more and more critical. More than ever, our daily lives revolve around these digitalized activities. And that's why we are much more exposed than ever to cyber threats and cyber attacks. Now, various supply chains related to food, transportation, payment and financial transaction systems, educational activities, government processes, emergency services, and the delivery of water and other public services such as Enery, all are based on digital technologies. As a matter of fact, last week, the cybersecurity company McAfee reported that new cyber threats are appearing at a rate of 375 times per minute, which is roughly a 2,000% increase compared to that same parameter the prior year. One day later, two federal agencies in the U.S. advised that all public sector and private sector organizations should take immediate actions to protect their critical infrastructure against cyber attacks. Now, many citizens in Latin America and the Caribbean are connected to the internet, and we have more than 70 million or 70 billion worth of dollars in terms of electronic business that's being conducted and transacted online. I imagine that many of you heard of the Twitter attack that happened just a few days whereby many of the private accounts of relevant people were hacked. In addition to the implication of these cyber attacks and their implication to our economy, which uh, represents a cost between half to a full percentage point of our GDP in our countries. And that's why at the IDB, we've launched different support initiatives for cybersecurity matters in recent years. And in fact, we've approved the first loan operation focused exclusively on cybersecurity. And we maintain this conversation at a time where almost 20,000 people are getting trained on, on our line courses on cybersecurity. These activities have been largely supported by the technical and financial support of the governments of Israel and Spain, who I'd like to thank today through their representatives for jo joining us in the conversation today. For all these reasons, the conversation that we're going to have now is very relevant. And now I have the pleasure of introducing the director of the National Intelligence Center in Spain. She is the coordinator of cybersecurity policy. We also have Igal Una, director of the National Cyber Directorate in Israel. And I also wanted to thank you both for dedicating some time to this uh, conversation today and sharing your experiences in protecting the cyberspace and also sharing the lessons learned that could be useful to the countries in the Latin American Caribbean region. 
Lastly, we also have the presence of our chief information officer at the bank, Nuria Simon, who I am very grateful to for all of the technology department's work on behalf of this institution. And Nuria's uh, team has been able to work in a very admirable way. She will speak briefly about the cybersecurity policies that the IDB has been working on. And with nothing further, I'd like to yield the floor to Nuria. Please go, get, go ahead, Nuria. And I look forward to hearing from the distinguished speakers today on how they are working at the national level. In the case of the IDB group in early March, as it became apparent that we could move into a period of mandatory teleworking in response to the COVID-19 crisis, I wondered if we were ready. I was confident that we were well prepared, but this unprecedented and unexpected event would be the ultimate stress test of our systems and our strategy, as well as a rare opportunity to measure the resilience of the institution's IT infrastructure, services, security, support, and overall technology literacy. We immediately analyzed more than 20 different operational risks that the management team had identified, and cybersecurity was certainly one of them. We have a global and a very mobile workforce, so it was always our intention to make sure that they were not tied to their office. When it was mandated to work from home, the IDB group had 100% of the users successfully working remotely from day one. This was a result of an information technology strategy approved by the ADP Board of Directors that included first, the ability to work from anywhere at any time, second, a cloud-first architecture principle with the goal to have 100% of our systems in the cloud by the end of 2020, and third, the use of security as an enabler, balancing between user needs and risk. In the successful transition to teleworking at ADP Group, most of the accolades went to the collaboration tools like Microsoft Teams in our case, and the remote accessibility of corporate systems, which work seamlessly thanks to our strategy of moving to the cloud and other investments, of course. However, the backbone of any IT operation is cybersecurity. Teleworking implies varying levels of risk depending on how the work environment con controls have been set up. If the controls are exclusively based on being on the physical network or in the VPN, protected by a network firewall and security controls, then working outside of the environment, like from home, increases the risk. As an example, in our case, one day, we had millions of events being analyzed by security devices in our network. And the next day, there were almost no network events. And the security alerts for the network dwindled to just a few. Uh, of course, it was not that the users were not working. They were just working outside our network. So we needed to look at the security events elsewhere. The IDP group had already moved most of our systems to the cloud. The security for each system was already in place and being monitored regardless of where the user was. For the many endpoints like user laptops, iPads and, and iPhones, we had already built an environment where the user was protected whether they were in one of the bank's 30 offices or at home. We had long ago rolled out multi-factor authentication for all devices when accessing cloud resources or the IDB VPN. This protects our cloud resources with added security and defense from brute force attacks. The security controls on laptops is even more important in this environment and includes device encryption, firewalls, vulnerability management, and advanced endpoint protection. And, of course, response technologies that provide visibility and security incident response for the appropriate IT security teams. An area that we made immediate improvements during the work from home was security patching. Previously, the laptops were patched exclusively on site or while connected to the VPN. During teleworking, we were able to make adjustments that now allowed us to run patches remotely. When the pandemic started, the IDB, like many other institutions, experienced a 300% increase in phishing attacks, with many of them specifically designed targeting bank users working from home what is known as spear phishing. Implementation of advanced email protection technologies allowed the security operation center, which operates 24 by 7, to respond to the increase in attack. Another important factor is the many experienced end users who have become good at spotting phishing emails after years of awareness campaigns. In conclusion, 
many years of investment in cybersecurity, accompanied by the replacement of less secure legacy technologies, has allowed us to maintain our risk levels and change in this new normal of teleworking. We are confident we have the right tools and processes in place, which are backed by, are backed up by constant monitoring and continued implementation of controls in response, response to a very changing environment. But successful cybersecurity goes beyond the IT department. It requires awareness and vigilance from every user in our organization. It is an ongoing effort that starts at an onboarding and continues as new tools and protocols are adopted. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to share our experience with the ID, at the IDB group. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Nuria. Gracias por, por todo tu trabajo. Quisiera entonces... Ahora... Thank you, Nuria. Thank you for all of your work. Now I'd like to yield the floor, of course, to Dr. Paz Esteban, so that she can discuss a little bit about what Spain has been doing in this regard. After which I would ask our colleague Igal to discuss the uh, situation in Israel. Good afternoon to everyone, Mr. President. Thank you to the IADB for the invitation to the National Intelligence Center in Spain to participate in this. For me, it's a pleasure to be able to address this distinguished panel. And we also have the National Cryptology Center, agency responsible for guaranteeing technology security for the Spanish public administration systems. The security of different systems that transmit uh, private uh, data, as well as organizations that have uh, strategic importance. And that is to say, those that have strategic importance for our national security and that are strategically important for our economy. This is part of the cybersecurity model that Spain has adopted in recent years. And our organization is an essential component. But first I'd like to give you an overview of the situation with regard to the pandemic and uh, discuss some of the policies of our leadership. From our standpoint, the pandemic has not created new risks, but in fact has accelerated and expanded the existing ones. And so as a result, COVID-19 has obliged us to examine our situation as well as the challenges that we face. And we need to analyze what potential evolution might take place and how we may respond to this evolution. As part of uh, the, our cybersecurity effort, we've been able to observe trends that we need to take into account. First and foremost, we've detected an increase in cyber attacks. And though in Spain we have been able to improve our alert systems and task assignment systems, what is also true is that when we apply this increased factor, so far we've been able to fend off a larger number of incidents uh, rated as very high risk uh, on the order of more than 2,000 and many other hundreds uh, of incidents uh, compared, which is many hundred of incidents greater than the prior year. Additionally, we have worked extensively with our public and private uh, partners and we've seen how many of these cyber attacks have expanded. And given the fact that more people are working from home, we see how we've been able to strengthen the teleworking systems. So in the traditional sectors, such as defense, aerospace, and energy, we've also added other institutions related with the pandemic. So we've added the medical industry pharmaceutical industry, as well as uh, medical facility networks. We all are aware that uh, cyber attacks are part of a hybrid uh, strategy employed by many states. And we know that their efforts are geared towards uh, disrupting national and local and regional capability. And given the impact on our economic systems, part of the effort is to disrupt the daily lives of our citizens. And this affects the social arena, the social well-being of our citizens and the tasks that we have taken on and that we've been asked to describe for it, the request of the IDB is geared towards trying to fend off these threats. In Spain, starting from the end of last century, we've tried to attach a greater strategic priority to defending our systems. 
This landscape that we've been consolidating in recent years has been part of a collective multidisciplinary effort that is based on three primary pillars. One of them is um, a, a, a comprehensive uh, data bank system, uh, uh, trustworthy and high confidentiality system to protect our, our information. And all of these efforts have been geared towards us strengthening our position. You know, based on these three pillars, our legal framework is uh, made up uh, by the existing legislation with regard to coding. And on the other hand, in the cybersecurity legislation, we also see another important component and tool that makes available to the requisite professionals all of the standards that they require to be able to undertake their efforts. All of our systems require the legal framework that I've just described and a clear cut set of rules. As part of our efforts to protect uh, digital systems as well as the cyberspace and by extension users, we've worked uh, to develop uh, different mechanisms to address different types of cyber crimes. Given this very broad um, regulatory framework, I wanted to emphasize that in recent years, we've been developing in Spain two cybersecurity strategies at the national level. The first one was developed in 2013 and the second one in 2019. Also important, in 2010, we approved the national security framework. So this set of codes, strategies, and mechanisms have uh, helped us create this integrated comprehensive cybersecurity system. In addition to this, we have a standard framework that I as the uh, director of the National Inter Intelligence Center use to undertake our efforts and this under the pur purview of the government. This is uh, a tool that is available to the president of our government to address issues of national importance related to cybersecurity. This is complemented by two elements, the Permanent Cybersecurity Commission, which allows for greater operational and technological capability related to these uh, cybersecurity threats, and another agency, the National Cybersecurity Forum, which was just uh, created a couple of weeks ago. And this is a public private space whereby the commission presides uh, this group. It involves all the competent authorities at the national level. And these include national government agencies, the uh, National Cryptology, Cryptology Response Center. Additionally, we work with uh, classified systems and we also work for with other public agencies, as well as with other countries. And the remaining actors that make up the organizational chart that related to the cybersecurity area in Spain. So the CCN is the agency that has the oversight authority to address any cybersecurity issues that may pose a threat to citizens and public and private organizations. As part of their efforts, we include the planning and implementation of various mechanisms related to the telecommunications and other technology arenas. On the other hand, the CENEPIC, uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Organization is the one that has the authority for the coordination and the development of policies and activities related to critical infrastructures in Spain. Likewise, as part of this same ministry, we include the Office of Cybernetic Initiatives, which include the response center to cybernet, cybernet or cyber attacks. Lastly, as part of the Ministry of the Interior, we address cyber crime issues with uh, the inclusion of the, the national technology systems of the national police and other public agencies. So this is the overall framework of the various authorities that have 
oversight capability and jurisdictional authority over cybersecurity issues. So it's clear that cybersecurity needs to be a strategic pillar of the highest order for any country. Given that uh, this is such a determinant uh, factor in our current geopolitical framework, in Spain's case, the work undertaken over the course of the past 20 years has allowed us to define a model that allows us at the national level to examine all of the challenges that we face, not only at the national level, but in our economic sector as well. Now, this also involves a collaboration that we've developed with our Ibero-American colleagues. And this was a driving factor in the agreement signed between Spain and the IDB in 2017. Therefore, we've redoubled our efforts for to try and uh, transfer our model into the region. And so in this model, many of the key areas addressed um, and many of which were examined through close work with the bank include developing experts on cybersecurity, providing a greater awareness related to the cybersecurity threat, which is extremely important. The training and skills building work done with uh, users and developers, greater and more extensive work with the public and private sectors, and support for security incidents, as well as work extensively in electoral processes. But we still believe that we have a great deal more to offer our friends in the Americas. And as a lessons learned for you, we'd like to mention new initiatives, such as the um, development of the digital forensic laboratory with all the uh, necessary cybernetic capacity and the concept of ethical hacking to be able to address some of these issues during the course of the pandemic. Within this framework, we offer this opportunity for collaboration to be able to strengthen these efforts in the health sector and try to identify any and all vulnerabilities to services and operations in that arena. Lastly, I'd like to mention that based on the accumulated experience for the CCN, since 2004, we've developed a, a list of more likely threats, and we'd like to share some recommendations, which are as follows. Create and approve a cybersecurity strategy, establish cybersecurity governance with the key stakeholders, as well as roles, develop the necessary regulatory framework for the categorization of systems, establish the CSERT for reference and sectoral matters, increase the monitoring capacity, both continuous and as well as, or under a continuous assessment and cyber vigilance, provide a framework for training and education and search for expert talent, public-private uh, cooperation, create a community, exchange information, generate or engender trust, and lastly, communicate, promote, and create this cybersecurity culture. So we work uh, on a very defined uh, plan that seeks to not only offer services, but engender trust in our communities to ensure their safety as well as their reliability. For this purpose, we want to include any actors and stakeholders that may be relevant to this process. Clearly, for future terms and, and reference, there's a great need for us to invest more heavily, both in the public and the private sector to be able to address these challenges accordingly. With that, I have nothing further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pase Esteban. Tell us a little bit about uh, all the great things you're doing in Israel. Welcome, uh, Yiga. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paz Esteban. Uh, in fact, in these uh, difficult times and dark era, uh, the, the great partnership we have with, with, the, with you, with the IDB, and with the Spain, with the CCN cert are a, a really great uh, 
ray, uh, ray beams of light that uh, uh, spread little light in all this uh, darkness and we appreciate that and uh, we look forward to even, even more of that. Uh, when we talk about uh, cybersecurity threats, well, just look at, uh, uh, when I look back, passing year of what we had here in Israel, we had three elections, uh, one Eurovision contest, the COVID-19, and that's uh, all aggregated and uh, uh, each, each in, uh, inside the other. So we are, uh, I don't know what can come next and what can we, we uh, need to, to carry on with uh, in the next phase, uh, but we sure need to be, to be prepared and not only Israel. I think the, the things that we, we uh, uh, suffer from in cybersecurity, we now understand much more than ever before in the, in the history of human beings that we, we are one globe and uh, the pandemic, it's, it's a pandemic, not an epidemic, not a local or regional uh, threats, but uh, uh, global. Uh, in cyber, in biology, in, in everything. Now, when we uh, talk about the, the threats, we now understand that uh, it's just probably a question of time, not if, but when uh, uh, every entity, either uh, political, uh, nationwide, uh, or, or national, or private sector, is going to get hit by some kind of, of a cyber threat. Uh, I'm wearing, you see, the Garmin watch. Uh, if, you, if you follow the news, uh, five days where uh, I don't have any service for my uh, Garmin uh, provider because they're under what is, is reported as a, a major cyber attack, probably a ransomware attack, that uh, hit them and they, they shut all the services. Now that they begin to, to come back, I don't know if they pay the ransom or manage to, to override it. But uh, it's another wake-up call for everyone to understand that it's, it's an imminent threat that all of us need to, to take much more severe uh, and, and uh, um, uh, focused measures to, to mitigate and, and to face it. Now, uh, if you take a look at the exploits that uh, uh, Microsoft, only Microsoft uh, published in recent six months, from January to just in July, major more than major, uh, zero days to say the least, uh, uh, that they published on uh, the uh, Tuesday uh, patches uh, just last month and uh, uh, months before, things that are there for 17 years. All the versions of Microsoft, of Windows and, and uh, uh, others are uh, uh, vulnerable to these kinds of exploit. Now we follow this like I believe uh, any other uh, responsible uh, uh, national cybersecurity agency and we doubled the stuff that deal with following and detecting the uh, new vulnerabilities and exploits that are published. This is the only thing that are published. We still uh, see more and more in the dark net and other places that are not uh, uh, too published or too in, in the open yet uh, that we need to, to fear from. And as we see what is behind us uh, is, is uh, over the surface, we, we can guess what is still behind the scenes and what is still to be found in the, in the couple of weeks or months or years uh, to come. Uh, above all of that, COVID-19. We entered the COVID-19 uh, crisis with, of course, all, all the, the other problems that uh, we face in Israel. But we need to take care of a, a list of, of missions. First of all, of, of course, def defending the uh, healthcare uh, system in Israel. Uh, we have a pretty good healthcare system that uh, keeps us uh, alive and healthy so far. Uh, but is, because it's modern and very uh, digitalized and very uh, updated, it's, it's more vulnerable to, to cyber attacks. And we uh, saw, not just in Israel, I think, or, globally in the Czech Republic and others that more and more attacks on the World, World Health Organization, more attack targeted at the, at the uh, uh, healthcare uh, services. And as hundreds of millions of kids and students were laid out from schools and the universities and went home, some of them find uh, uh, gaming as their uh, resort and others found hacking as the result, and uh, we see the increase as, as 
uh, 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 Dr. Esteban mentioned and others, that we, we see more and more attacks uh, during this uh, couple of months, and it's still growing. How is Israel uh, prepared and how we deal with that? The INCD, my uh, directorate, the cyber directorate, is two and a half years old in this uh, uh, current version. Before that, we had trials and errors. We, we tried one way and changed to another way. Since January uh, 2018, we're focused and, and uh, running in this model. The first thing to, to understand is, and very important, I think, is who we do report to. And in Israel uh, the, and other successful models around the globe, we see that it's crucial that the, the cyber directorate, the cyber agency, is as independent as it get, can get and reporting to the highest instance that can, can be. In Israel, we report to the prime minister himself and we enjoy the overview from the, the highest instance, the, the prime minister's office, to see all the, the Israeli national security, economic, uh, uh, civilian, and other legislation uh, processes um, uh, from uh, uh, above, and to see that we can implement the cybersecurity by design from the earliest stages in uh, uh, public policy issues, in national security uh, programs, and other places. Second, we began, uh, my predecessors were uh, responsible only for the strategy and for the uh, a, a design of a, how the cybersecurity should be. We implemented a, in the last three and a half, four years, a strong operational a, capabilities in the cyber directorate so we can a, get to the a, incidents or to suspected incidents, cyber incidents by ourselves without any a, need of help from any other agency and to take care of the, the incident from detection, from the early stages of, of suspicion detection, to closing it and making sure that it, it's, it's away and, uh, and the problem is, is gone and the damage is removed. Now, our mission is not to uh, prevent attacks. That is an impossible mission. Our mission is to prevent damage uh, or crucial damage, critical damage from this kind of attacks. And that's a big uh, uh, difference or, or, or big nuance that need to be taken care of because attacks are, are there and will be and will be more. Uh, the, we're in a risk management business. So we need in a nationwide, on a, on a national level, to make sure that our uh, crown jewels, our critical things that growing instantly, as, as uh, uh, mentioned in Spain and other places, as we go more and more digitalized, more and more modern, we need to, to map all the critical paths, all the critical processes, and see that we can take a, a, a tailor-made uh, the uh, cybersecurity measures, each and every process by itself, and uh, uh, to make sure that we, we uh, don't cause a damage by the security itself. Many times we see that in, in order to make sure that you're more secure, uh, you're hurting yourself, you, you're causing, uh, you're inflicting more damage than the possible damage that statistically could have uh, been uh, done by the uh, attacks. So uh, focusing on this kind of, of uh, approach of, of minimizing the damage and not the number of the attacks or the uh, publicity of the attacks, it, in fact, it, it does need uh, to take care of, of uh, journalists and the newspapers to, to, to teach them, to educate them, not to get too excited from any, uh, you know, defaced website, because it doesn't matter. It, yes, it's not, it's not nice, but it's, it's not something that the, the, the government and the, on the national level should bother us. Another thing is defining what is cybersecurity. It looks like obvious, but we define cyber as specifically gaining unauthorized access to computer networks or to computers. Now, even my watch is, is a kind of computer, but uh, once the, the, the bad guys gain unauthorized access, they can do whatever they want. They can uh, spy or steal the data. They can uh, change the data or, or take it like in the financial uh, uh, cyber crimes. They can do, uh, uh, they can cause physical damage 
like uh, SCADA, uh, ICS, industrial control systems and others, and of course, influence campaigns. So uh, uh, we define that, but what is beyond cybersecurity and not defined as cybersecurity is all the other problems that we have in the internet. We have uh, uh, stings uh, operations and we have uh, pedophilia and we have uh, 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 botnets that uh, try to, to manipulate uh, elections around the globe. If it, it doesn't get to gaining unauthorized access, then we're not dealing with that. Another definition, and I think in Israel we're unique in that, is we, we define cyber as ICT versus ICT, information communication technologies versus ICT, meaning that it's not just, uh, you know, the traditional, if you can call cyber traditional, it's 10 or 12 years old, but uh, it's not just the classical cybersecurity, it's also, uh, it deals with what we call electronic warfare, like GPS jamming and spoofing, like adversarial artificial intelligence, a growing threat that we should uh, take a, a better look and a, a better care of, and other uh, things that, Again, ICT versus ICT, and there are much more threats growing uh, aside uh, and uh, sideways of the, the main classical cyber attacks that are still there, as I mentioned. Now, uh, we talked about the INCD, we talked about the, the, uh, uh, how we work, and we have, of course, strategy. And our strategy is since 2012, and we check it all the time, and we don't see any reason to change the basics of the strategy. And the basics are three layers. First layer is what we call robustness. Now, uh, we, uh, in my previous uh, uh, keynotes uh, uh, in previous years, I, I need to take a time to, to explain the similarity between uh, uh, cybersecurity and the physical, biological uh, pandemics, like measles. The COVID-19 uh, saved me the, the bother to, to explain what are the, what is uh, epidemics or pandemics. So now we all understand that the first layer of robustness meaning to reduce the, the what we call the social distancing, to reduce the attack surface, to make sure that we, we are keeping two meters from one another also in the networks. And all the, the measures that we take care of, like critical infrastructure and others, to make sure that the, the viruses uh, computer viruses won't uh, get uh, to, to, to places that we don't want to, to them to get. But we realize that it's not enough and eventually no hermetic solutions. So the second layer is what we call resilience, meaning how to uh, uh, detect as, as early as can, can we, we get to, to detect the uh, attack, to uh, identify the uh, uh, infected, and to uh, take care of them, to remove the uh, attacks, remove the attackers, close the holes and the, the gaps that the attacker managed to, to penetrate, and uh, to make sure that they don't come again from the same place. And the third layer is getting away from the analogy of the uh, biological pandemics, and remember that it's not computers against computers, it's about people, bad people that trying to harm us uh, either from a, a financial motivation, national security motivation, or just vandalism. But in any case, we need to take care with these specific people. So we use, not in my directorate, that we use with other uh, uh, partners of, of uh, Dr. Esteban from our intelligence community, to take care of, of these elements or with the police uh, dealing with the, the criminal side. So we are national security agency, but not usual national security agency, but more open uh, and not a law enforcement. We don't indict, we don't get the criminals, apprehend the criminals. We just uh, uh, looking with the intelligence, all kinds of intelligence and with detection tools and other tools to, to uh, manage the risks and to make sure that the damage uh, is, is not uh, inflicted and that we, we, we can keep the attackers away from the crown jewels from the world, uh, it's, it's uh, more important. I think that will be for the time being. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Miguel. Uh, Doctora, uh, Doctora Paz, una, España. Dr. Paz, Spain, of course, is known today for the adoption of 
uh, digital technologies within the framework of the EU, and it's in second place with digital services in the digital economy. So what cybersecurity strategies are you using to protect all of these advances, all of this progress that Spain is making? Yes, as I mentioned during my presentation, I really feel that Spain has been a pioneer in giving cybersecurity the importance it needs and in designing policies to face the huge challenges that we have when we generalize communications and uh, information technologies. And we have a framework that we have designed and uh, put together, and I think it's a good example. I also talked about two strategies, uh, national level strategies that we've had, and these are in line with successive national strategies that we've had and that they are derived from, and this has allowed us to establish certain goals with lines of action and the necessary means to increase a level of security and to implement them. In both strategies, we've prioritized a, an in, integrated comprehensive model. We have the government for the coordination of all the public administrations and between these and the public and the private sector and the citizenry, this integrated model also is good for international dealings with initiatives and bringing together efforts with our allies in the defense of cyberspace. But in, as in the case of any activity where there are interactions, we need to have governance rules for the behavior of everyone involved and their respective roles. And these are rules that deal with uh, rights and duties, but are also catalysts for this sector and favor the strengthening and the growth uh, within this sector. So digital advances need as a condition to have certain uh, security and organizational measures taken. In 2010, as a result of the work of our uh, cryptological center and the national digital administration office we approved our ens our national security framework that i've mentioned earlier and it is just common principles requirements measures and uh, standards adapted to the needs and requirements of the public sector which in our country has over 30,000 entities that are a part of it when we count the central government as well as the uh, governments of our regions. So this is a very large uh, number of organizations and identities and entities. So in its uh, 10 years, the ENS, the National Security Framework has become our main tool and it is uh, really unique among the countries that are around us. Now times are changing, of course, and we find ourselves in a phase where we are reviewing and revising to adapt to new standards and having better responses to new trends in cybersecurity in order to cure vulnerabilities and promote more active defense. This, uh, its framework, and which is what the president was asking me about, has allowed our country to reach a level of maturity where we have established roles for various actors that I've mentioned earlier, defined roles, and these are all involved in our cybersecurity panorama without repeating efforts. So we have good governance among our actors, and this has allowed us to have a vision and a common understanding of the challenges ahead of us and the road ahead of us as well. So the transposing of the EU's directive from 2016 by the European Parliament, the NICE directive, has helped with all of this because all the measures that help to have a high level of security in networks and information systems in the European uh, Union. So it's being transposed into our own law has allowed us to identify operators of essential uh, services and determine which are the competent authorities and the certs or the computer security incident response teams that are responsible in each case. So I hope this answers your question, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Doctor.
one sees around cybersecurity, and I've seen it firsthand when I've been in Israel a couple of times, is the enormous amount of business activity that has developed around cybersecurity. There's over 500 companies today that export in excess of $5 billion just on cyber services each year. How was that uh, industry developed? How much uh, did it get supported or induced or uh, uh, rallied, let's say, by the Israeli government? Well, that's a, a tricky question because uh, we, are all, we all believe in the PPP, public-private uh, partnerships. And in cybersecurity, well, most of these companies, if not all of them, they uh, began as ideas and, and uh, uh, great soldiers in the military, in the cyber units, most of them. Once they, they helped and, and uh, were part of the Israeli national security effort, they finished their military service, they, they done their duty, and they, they got out to the market, and surprisingly, they saw that they can harness what they've done to the uh, uh, national benefit to their own benefit. So they need approvals, of course, to, to, uh, to translate what they have from the national security side to more commercial side, and we help them with that. But we believe in partnership. Example of this partnership can be seen in the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, era. The first time that the Israeli government need to shut down everything, we need, of course, to keep some of the uh, critical businesses and critical processes still open and alive and kicking. Uh, so the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the markets and the uh, groceries were taken care of by, by the uh, relevant ministry. We took care of all the cyber industry. Why? Because we needed them to be free and fully operational to keep Israel safe because they give most of the services to the, to the public. They sell it commercially. So we make sure that they uh, run, can run openly. So we remove obstacles. We, we make sure that we pave the, the, the way for them to operate as free as they can. And we help them, of course, internationally. So we, we, uh, when we see our friends in, in Latin America and all, the, all around the globe, that they need a quick and good solutions, cybersecurity solutions, we in Israel, everyone knows everyone else. In the cyber community, even, even uh, more than in other areas. So we can connect and see how we can gather forces and make a, a good team and cybersecurity is all about partnership and teamwork and, and uh, uh, connect the right team to uh, the right problem and to make the, 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 be the best solutions. And that's what Israelis do best because we depend on, on one another uh, for our lives. And we, you mentioned the Israeli industry. Yes, uh, uh, in fact, the numbers are more like 600 companies, even now with the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And the uh, 2019 numbers are $6.5 billion export in the Israeli uh, cybersecurity uh, business. And we look even uh, to, to, to enhance that because we believe it's not just good for business. It's good for partnership, for diplomatic relations, for everything to everyone to be more safe and secure from the best solutions. And I think that the Israeli solutions can compete in the front line of these kinds of solutions. The Israeli government just makes sure that no obstacles and no uh, uh, problems in the way we move them, remove them uh, aside. Thank you very much, Jigal, uh, uh, on this. Uh, Dr. Paz, una question. Cuando uno Dr. Paz, there's another matter there. The, the issue of the origin of these cyber attacks, at least as far as we can see, mainly they come from developed countries, but it's starting to happen a lot more in emerging economies as well. Of course, you are monitoring what happens in Spain, attacks coming into Spain, but also coming in from other parts of the world. What kind of evolution do you see here? What changes have you seen? Your microphone is muted. I'm sorry, we couldn't hear the question. That's okay. That's okay, I'll repeat the question. 
I was saying that when we look at the number of cybersecurity attacks taking place, we see that they often come from developed countries. But increasingly, we start to see that they come from other countries as well. I imagine you monitor attacks coming from within Spain, but also coming from other parts of the world into Spain. So what have you seen in terms of this evolution and where these attacks are coming from? Well, going back to what I said in my introduction, the pandemic definitely has shown a light on a quantitative increase in attacks, but also a qualitative change in terms of how serious these new attacks are. And it's true, it's not just from developed countries that this increase is coming from. This has also, as you were saying, President, is also affecting countries with a lower level of development. And as usual, it's a matter of opportunity where systems are better protected, that's in more uh, developed countries and where there might be greater ease to access information. This can be in countries that have a lower level of security in terms of how they protect their networks. And of course, those who want to attack us take advantage of these weaknesses. And also they might have objectives, as I was saying earlier, that have a lot to do with hybrid strategies. It's not just about uh, stealing information or technological, industrial or economic property of countries, but also it's a matter of having opportunities. And I'm at, uh, referring to state actors now who seek opportunities to reinforce their positions and to achieve perhaps political or strategic goals that they have. This is one of the characteristics that we have seen during these last few months. But this was only adding to what we had already been seeing in previous months, but they've become very clear now. And that use of hybrid strategies, among which are cyber attacks and closely linked during these pandemic months with uh, misinformation. This has made all of this very clear, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Dr. Paz. You guys. That our time is running out, but talk to us. I, I recently saw that you're starting to get a, even cyber attacks on, on water and sanitation systems in Israel. Uh, you know, this of course is extremely dangerous. It, it, it creates, you know, huge amounts of havoc anywhere. Uh, how are you dealing with this threat? Well, uh, that is true. Uh, we, since uh, the end of April, we witnessed uh, a new era. We, we entered a new phase in cybersecurity wars as we see what is attributed by uh, uh, American uh, journalists to Iran uh, as a, a new phase of attacks directed uh, directly to uh, aiming and targeting humanitarian, uh, the basic, like of basics, like watering and, and uh, sewage and other uh, uh, critical uh, systems. The, the good news, they, they couldn't manage to hit, and I may re remind you, my business is minimizing or, or removing damage uh, or, or uh, preventing damage, not uh, preventing the attacks. So the attacks occurred, but uh, they manage only to, to scratch the epidermis, only the, the outskirts of, of uh, some of the less, if not non-critical at all systems. The critical systems are uh, intact. And the, the way to, to uh, get to that is remember, again, partnership and, and, and uh, uh, teamwork. So our philosophy, we're a pretty big agency. We manage not to do this ourselves. We, we don't like the word regulation, we prefer incentives. So we approach, in this case, the, the watering authority. And not, not now, but a, a couple of years ago. And we help them as we help all the other regulators, already existing regulators like energy, transportation and others to build their own cyber small directorates, a, a, a mini me of, of the INCD 
in their ministries, so it's their own. They're responsible for the cybersecurity, not me. I'm guiding them, I'm giving them the intelligence, I give them the, the, uh, all the assistance they need. I even give them room, physical room, in our Be'er Sheva National Cert Facility. Uh, and you all should uh, come when it's available to, to come over to Israel. You're all invited to come and over and see the oasis that we have in the desert in Be'er Sheva. And we give the watering uh, authority all they need to do what they already need to do, which is to make sure that the water is fluent and clean and uh, go uh, all the time. In the case of, of a severe attack, a national security attack, we get also into the trenches and help them fight uh, in our specific uh, and special tools to, to mitigate it. But we are relying already on a, a, a good uh, a ground base of, of already existing cyber units, small cyber unit that is already there and knows the way better than us we deal on a national level. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nigal, for that. Y, y por último, uh, doctora, uh, and lastly, Dr. Paz, what recommendations would you have for Latin American governments in terms of the best way to uh, protect their cyber networks and to have cyber security policies? In the case of Spain, we have a national cyber security strategy. And if I may talk about the success of our model, it's been due to the fact that we have had a, an open uh, national security framework open to possibilities, and it has allowed us to facilitate a better response to cybersecurity trends, reduce vulnerabilities, and promote continuous monitoring. It's important to use technology, cloud services, uh, and mobile and cellular devices, electronic uh, hubs. But the challenge is in doing it in an organized way with roadmaps, with the express commitment of all involved actors, manufacturers, entities, users, etc., and trying to align the requirement of the measures with the economic uh, effort needed and always uh, trying to achieve the level of security that's needed and the essential mandate is to promote the trust of citizens in the use of electronic media also promoting their use in a secure way such that the uh, exposure to cyber threats is measurable controlled and adapted to the ecosystem to the public sector critical infrastructures, investigation in the academia, health sector, etc. Ultimately, what we need to have is common sense. We need to be able to measure security that exists. If we can measure, then we can manage. And if we can manage something, then we can move forward and find that balance between the capabilities and functionalities that technology can give us and a secure use of it. An example, in Spain, we're developing projects for our national security framework within uh, scientific and technical uh, centers. These projects include plans for certification and adaptation to our national security framework implementation of these plans through virtual uh, means and uh, raising awareness, plans to raise awareness. In other words, we promote the implementation of uh, greater security through these centers. We also do it in an orderly way through what has been established in our national security framework without forgetting about people executing plans to raise awareness and educate the public. These are some of the recommendations that I would humbly give to our colleagues in Latin America if they want to strengthen their cybersecurity policies. You need to make cybersecurity possible without trying to go too far beyond your possibilities. You need to have uh, reachable goals, but they need to always be open to improvement so you can continue to grow and advance based on three essential 
concepts, procedure, technology, and training, and skill and capacity building. Thank you very much, doctor, and I'd also like to thank Igal, and I'd like to remind all of you who are with us that tomorrow, the IDB and the OAS together will launch a study on the cybersecurity situation in Latin America and the Caribbean. And what the data show us is that our countries still have a very long road ahead of them in this field. I'd like to share one piece of information with you. Seven countries out of 32 countries we studied have a critical infrastructure protection plan. That's a very few. Thank you to Igal and Dr. Paz for being with us today and for the technical and financial support you have provided. And let's continue to work together so that with all the good experiences we've had working together, we can provide support to the countries of our region. And I also want to thank Nuria, especially for sharing some of the cybersecurity measures that have been implemented at the IDB and which have allowed this uh, remote working that we're doing, working from home at the IDB in a very successful way. Once again, thank you everyone and good afternoon.